Gospel of John this morning, Gospel of John chapter number 4, thank you for the good songs, amen, appreciate the Lord, His goodness, amen, I'm glad we can rest our case at the cross, we can know we're saved, amen, and amen, John chapter number 4, John chapter number 4, back my monitor down just a line or two, all right, John chapter number 4, verse number 19, is where you'll find your place, John 4, 19. The Bible said, the, the woman saith unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship, ye know not what, Or if you cut me off, that's much better. Amen. All right. Amen. Verse 24 again. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. I'm preaching on this thought this morning on it's time to worship. It's time to worship. Can we go to the Lord in a word of prayer? Our Father, we thank you, God, for your goodness. We thank you, God, for allowing us another opportunity to be here. And I pray, God, that you'd help us today as we come to you. I pray, have your will and way in all that's said and done. Help me to preach what needs to be preached. Help me, Lord, I pray, to mind you. And, Lord, I pray that the listeners would hear what thus saith the Lord. Speak to our hearts and help us in this time. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. There is much talk today about worship. We have in our day people having Uh, promotions of worship services, there are worship songs, there are worship retreats, worship this, worship that. All across the realm of Christendom, there's much talk of worship. Books are written on worship. Seminars are held concerning worship. Debates and dissertations abound about the subject of worship. But I'm interested this morning in knowing not what man thinks, but what does the Bible say about the matter? What does the Lord Jesus Christ say about worship? In our text that we've read from this morning, Jesus, you know the story in John 4, he has encountered what we call the woman at the well. She's a Samaritan woman, and being a Samaritan, she was astonished that Jesus, a Jew, would engage in conversation with her, but he had assured her back in the first part of the chapter that he must needs go through Samaria. He must needs go through Samaria to meet a little girl down there who was standing in need. And in our text, Jesus encounters this woman. And in the process of this encounter that she had with Jesus, it was revealed that she needed more to drink than what she could ever draw from Jacob's well. It was revealed that she knew the customs and she knew the traditions and she knew all the religious things uh, and the, of the crowds in her day, uh, but she did not know God nor how to worship him personally. And Jesus here in our text taught this little Samaritan woman about worship. Now, when we come to the Word of God and we look up the word worship, we find this word here in the New Testament means to kiss the hands toward, or it, it's, it's a token of reverence among the Orients and the Persians, especially it was to fall on the knees and to touch the ground with the forehead as an expression of profound reverence. So when one would come into the presence of a king, a royal person, they would fall before them, put their head to the ground, showing them great respect and reverence. And so in the New Testament, it's by kneeling or prostration to do homage to one and to make obeisance, whether in order to express respect or to make supplication of them. And it's used to, uh, of homage shown to men and beings of superior rank. And so when the Bible talks about worship, it's not about all this. It's more about getting down here. I'd, be, I'd bow down for you, y'all this morning, but my knee's kind of 
in a bind. But uh, the word the strong says that the word uh, comes from uh, two words. It's a derivative of uh, of a word meaning to kiss like a dog licking his master's hand. What about that? It is to fawn or to crouch to to prostrate oneself in homage and to reverence and to adore and to worship. The, the word worship comes from an old word, worship. When we study the etymology of the word, it comes from, it has evolved from the word worship that we don't really use in our vocabulary anymore, but the word worship denotes the worth of one that is worshipped. And so we have evolved to the word worship. And so that's the idea that when I worship one, I am showing them the honor, the due, uh, the, the, that they receive uh, what they are uh, worth to me. I am bowing before them because I realize they are superior to me because they may not need me, but I sure enough need them. And so when we worship God, that's exactly what we're doing. We're coming into the presence of a holy God, and we are humbling ourselves. We are bowing before him. He may not need me, but I sure need him this morning. Somebody say amen. And so when we think about this thing of worship, it's important that we understand what worship is. And I want you to see some things about worship with me this morning. There's a principle or a law in, in interpretation of Scripture that we call the law or the principle of first mention. And that simply means that the first time that something is mentioned in Scriptures, it gives us some light, it gives us some detail into that subject matter and how we will understand it throughout the rest of Scripture. The very first time that you find the word worship in your King James Bible is in Genesis chapter number 22. And you Bible students, y'all know Genesis 22 well. In Genesis 22 is when God had given Abram his son Isaac, his son of promise, and he had that son, and he loved his son. Matter of fact, Genesis uh, 22 two talks about his son whom he loveth. And in Genesis 22, God told Abram to take his son and go up on Moriah's hill and to sacrifice his son. And in Genesis chapter number 22, uh, the Bible says, and we may look at this in a little bit later, uh, Genesis 22, that Abraham told his servants, he said, y'all stay here while me and the lad go yonder to worship. He was going to take the son that God had promised him, the son that was his prized possession, the son whom he loved, and he was going to take him up and lay him down. Now, y'all know the story. He took him up there, and his son said, Father, we've got the wood, we've uh, got the fire, but where's the lamb? And Abram told his son, Son, God will provide himself a lamb. And they got up there, and God, lo and behold, when they got up there and Abraham pulled up the knife, God had a ram in the thicket uh, for a sacrifice, and God spared Isaac when he saw that Abram was humbled and surrendered to God. So we learned some things there about worship that will help us as we go throughout the Scriptures. I want you to notice in our text this morning a few truths here about this thing of worship because I'm telling you today in our day in which we live, a lot of people talk about worship, but from the uh, exhibit of what they call worship and the way they talk about worship, when we look at the Bible, they don't know what worship is. And so we come to the Bible, and I see the disorientation about worship. Verses 19 through 23 of our text, this woman uh, that there Jesus met at the well, she was disoriented and confused about worship and about God. And I tell you today, many people in our churches even are disoriented and confused about the very same things that this little Samaritan woman was confused about in her day. She was confused about the place of worship. She said, our fathers worshiped in this mountain. She said in verse number 20, our fathers worshiped in this mountain, and ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. She was caught up in the tradition. She was caught up in the customs, but she did not know the truth. There's a lot of people, and even in our Baptist churches, that are caught up in a lot of tradition. They think because they come to church at 11 o'clock on Sunday that they are worshiping God. You know, the Jews, they had a temple in Jerusalem where was their place of worship and the Samaritans had built a temple on Mount Gerizim uh, to rival the one in Jerusalem because the Samaritans had been separated politically, uh, ethic, uh, 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 
politi- politically, I, I would say, I hate the word race, but racially, if you will, uh, and, and religiously for many years. The, they had nothing to do with one another, so they didn't worship in the same place. And the, so the Samaritans had a, a temple up on the mount, and the Jews had a temple in Jerusalem. But Jesus here in this text revealed to this woman that where a person worships is unimportant when compared to who a person worships. The where is not the main thing. Jesus uh, was teaching this woman about worship. You know, today the Jews, they have temples. They have a, a place in Jerusalem. They have uh, places where they worship. The, the, the Muslims have a Mecca, right, where they try to make their trip and their journey. And, and you matter of fact, I was up in Virginia a few years ago traveling, and I was coming down 81 South because that's the only way to travel on 81 is to go south, praise God. And so we was coming down the road, and we got off, and we was at a gas station there, and it was, I don't know, it was time in the evening. We stopped to get some gas, and I seen a few guys pull up, and they pulled up in the parking lot, and they got out. They didn't go in the store. They didn't get gas. They they took some towels or, or blankets, and they started laying them out in the middle of the parking lot. And my wife's honest witness, hey, listen, they bowed down right there in the gas in the gas station parking lot and began to pray towards their holy place. Because it was important to them that not only were they praying, but they had to pray at the right time and they had to face the right direction because they thought that was what matters. And I tell you, that don't matter. You can do that all day long at the right place in the right direction, but if you're praying to the wrong God, you're going to hell. And so, th- th- listen, people, hey, listen, people in our Baptist churches, they got their rituals and they got their traditions. They'll fight over 11 o'clock. They'll fight over 6 o'clock or 7 o'clock or whatever it might be. They'll fight over their pew. They'll fight over whether we're inside or we're outside or we're in the building or under a tent. And they'll argue about things like that. And I'm glad this morning that we may not ever be able to get to the special place that we designate. There's nothing wrong with that. But even if we can't get to a special place, we got a supernatural person that we worship. Amen. A sovereign God. Just because you're in church building the sticks and the mortar this morning, just because you're here does not mean that you're worshiping God. I feel like preaching a little bit. Just because you're here at New Hope doesn't mean you're worshiping God. That just means you're here. Just because you sing doesn't mean you're worshiping. Worship is not confined to a particular place, but it's an action of the heart that adores God. And so this woman was confused about the place of worship. She was confused about the person of worship. Uh, That's the object of her worship. Jesus said in verse 22, Ye worship, ye know not what. He said, woman, you're worshiping, and you don't even know what you're worshiping. He said, we know what we worship for salvations of the Jews. So Jesus revealed to this woman that not only was she confused about the place of worship, but she was confused about what or who she worshiped. The Jews knew who they worshiped because salvation is of the Jews. That is, salvation come through the Jews in that Jesus was born a Jew and the Jews were the first to witness and the first to proclaim the good news that a Savior had come into this world. And many today are worshiping worship. Can I say that? There's many people talk about worship and, and they'll fight you over their worship center or their worship song or their worship service. And they are, listen, when you get down to it, they are following after emotions and entertainment, but worship is far from the picture. I'm telling you this morning, just going through motions or emotions is not necessarily worship. Brother Alfred Willis said, emotion without devotion is commotion. And there's a lot of people in our churches that are doing just that. And listen, they may, have, they may uh, be uh, well-meaning. They may be deceived. They may ha- have, have a good intent. But if it's not genuine biblical worship, it doesn't matter. A lot of people going through a lot of, a lot of uh, motions this morning. But it's like their wheels are turning, but they ain't hitting the ground. Listen, they, she was confused about the person of worship. We worship the Lord this morning. We don't worship the preacher. We don't worship the president. Somebody say amen. We, and listen, we don't worship no politician. We're not worshiping athletes. We're not worshiping ministers and evangelists. We're to worship God. 
She was confused about the participants of worship. He said, but the hour cometh, in verse 23, and now is, watch this, when true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and truth. True worship. The word true speaks of that which is not only has the name and the resemblance, but it is real in the real nature that corresponds to the name in every respect. They are true. They are genuine. They are the opposite of that which is fictitious or counterfeit or imaginary or simulated or we would say pretended. They are true in that they are sincere worshipers. A worshiper is one who adores, a one who humbles himself and shows worth to another. So just as there are true worshipers, there are pretend or counterfeit worshipers. Just as there are some who who come to church and they don't even have to be at church, some who in their closet at home or some maybe in their living room and throughout their life, wherever they be, they humble themselves before God and they surrender themselves and they submit themselves to God and they show Him worth through their life. And then there are some who sing a song and raise their hands and they are going through motions and pretending to worship. I tell you this morning real clear that if you don't know that uh, what worship is about and you don't know the person that worship is about and you don't know that it's not about a person and you don't or that it is about a person and that it is not about a place then you're obviously not a true worshiper worship's not about the place it's about the person and his name is Jesus Christ so there's a disorientation there's a lot of confusion in our day about what worship is. A lot of people think that because they get together with 5,000 other people and raise their hands and sing Kumbaya that they're worshiping. That's not, and listen, that is not necessarily worship. Now, that doesn't mean nobody there is worshiping. Let me just say this. Did you worship this week? Did you worship Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday? If you didn't worship all week long, you're probably not worshiping here this morning. See, a lot of people are confused about worship. Worship is, is not necessarily uh, the expression that we see, but it's the humble attitude and the action of a heart that is submitted to God. Now, sometimes it does express itself. Sometimes it is at the church house. But other times it's going down the road in the car or standing in the shower or in some other place that where there's nobody else but you and God. And if the only time you can worship is when they're playing a certain kind of music, then you ain't worshiping. There's a disorientation, a confusion about worship. There's a desire for worship in verse uh, 23. The Bible said, for the, Jesus said, the Father seeketh such to worship him. He is seeking such to worship. The word seek here means to seek in order to find. It is to seek for, to demand, to crave. To demand something from someone. You know, today God is seeking worshipers. We've got performers, we've got singers, we've got workers, we've got gatherers, we've got onlookers, we've got, listen, we've got plenty of spectators. But what God is looking for is worshipers. He's not looking for uh, billboard names, He's not looking for for popularity. He's not looking for people that are famous. He's looking for worshipers. He's looking for those that will humble themselves in his presence, that will lay themselves at his feet, that will show him worth and worship him, seeking him. He redeemed man, God did. He sent his son to redeem man and to turn them from wanderers going their own way to worshipers. We see that all the way back in Genesis chapter number 3. In Genesis chapter number 3, when Adam and Eve disobeyed and took of the fruit of which they were forbidden, uh, we see that they were hiding from God, but God came to them. He killed animals. He clothed them with skin, and he redeemed them. He restored them because ever since then, he has been redeeming man to turn them into worshipers. Satan desires to steal man's worship as well. We see that in, in Matthew chapter 4, one of the temptations. In Matthew 4, he tried to tempt Jesus to worship him. He's trying to steal the worship of the Lord. And he does this through the temptations, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the and the pride of life. But God is seeking those to worship him. I wonder if you want to worship him. 
A.W. Tozer said something wonderful, miraculous, life-changing takes place within the human soul when Jesus Christ is invited to take his rightful place. This is exactly what God anticipated when he wrought the plan of salvation. He intended, listen, to make worshipers out of rebels. He intended to restore to men and women the place of worship which our first parents, Adam and Eve, knew when they were created. I can safely say on the authority of all that is revealed in the Word of God, that any man or woman on this earth who is bored and turned off by worship is not ready for heaven. Well, they worship God. They, they're going to worship God, whether it's by testimony or by song or by life. Hell, that's boring to me, preacher. i got to have something more exciting. You ain't ready to go to heaven. Think about it. The God of heaven, who is above all, who created all, he's separate from sin. He is in need of nothing. He is self-existent and self-sufficient. Yet he seeks and he desires the adoration and the worship of his children today. He doesn't ask for a whole lot. He asks for all. Think about it. God desires your worship. Can I go a step further? God not only desires your worship, he deserves your worship. Nobody loves you like God does. Hey, listen, nobody else sent their only begotten son to die for your sin. Nobody else loved you, gave himself for you. Nobody else went to the cross. Nobody else went to the grave. Nobody else conquered death, hell, and the grave on your step. Hey, can I say, hey, listen, your favorite race car driver didn't do it. Your favorite singer didn't do it. Are you listening to me this morning? Your favorite preacher didn't even do it. The only person that did that for you, his name's Jesus Christ. And I'm telling you, not only does he desire your worship, but he deserves your worship. He not only deserves your worship for what he's done, he deserves your worship for who he is. He is the Almighty. He is the only one who's holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sin. He's the only one that's worthy of your worship. He deserves your worship. He desires your worship, and he demands your worship. Yes, amen. I thought about Psalm 45, 11, said, So shall the king greatly desire thy beauty, for he is thy Lord, and worship thou him. Psalm 95, 6, O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our maker. Psalm 99, 9, exalt the Lord our God and worship at his holy hill, for the Lord our God is holy. In Revelation 19, 10, you might as well get ready to worship because uh, John said, he said, I fell at his feet to worship him. And sa he said unto me, talking about that servant, that angel, he said, see thou not do it, I am thy fellow a servant and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus worship God for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy Revelation 22 9 then saith the unto me this is John again see thou do it not for I am thy fellow servant of thy brethren the prophets and of, of them that keep thy sayings of this book worship God I'm telling you God demands our worship thought about the disorientation of worship. I thought about the desire for worship. But then I, Brother Josh, thought about the demands for worship. Verse 24 said, God is a spirit. And watch this. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. The truth that God is a spirit is revealed to this lady to emphasize the spiritual character of God and the spiritual characteristic of worship. And he said they that worship him must. Mark that word, must. The word must is of necessity. It's necessary. In other words, it behooves us. It is right and proper. It's of a necessity of law and command, and it's of duty. That this is not that we just worship, but that this is how we worship. In other words, if we're going to worship God and truly worship Him and be true worshipers of Him, there are some ingredients that must be involved in this worship. And he tells them right here in verse 24, he said that true worship involves, number one, it involves spirit. 
That has to do with our salvation, our, our spirit. You notice here that when it says God is a spirit, that's a capital S, denoting that is God, he is a spirit. But he said when they that worship him must worship him in spirit, you notice that's a little s. That's talking about our spirit. If I'm going to worship God, I'm not just going to do it in my body going through motions. I'm afraid this is where we miss it. There's a lot of people got their body in the right place. They got their body doing right motions, but they're not worshiping him in spirit. Are you listening? They must worship him in spirit. The natural man has a spirit that is dead. And our spirit, uh, can I explain it? Our spirit is how we communicate with God who is a spirit. See, he told us God is a spirit. The only way that I communicate with God is through my spirit bearing witness with his spirit. See, I can write a letter to God, but God's not here in a body. He's a spirit. So my spirit must be made right so I can communicate with God. But I'm born dead. Ephesians 2 says we're dead in our trespasses and sins. Somebody say amen. It doesn't mean that I'm dead in a body. It means that I'm dead spiritually. That means spiritually I am separated from God. And to be able to be able to communicate with God, a man must have his spirit quickened or made alive. And this only occurs at salvation when our spirit is regenerated or quickened by the Holy Spirit. That's when you got born again. When you got saved, you become alive inside. That's your spirit. You see, before anyone can truly worship God, they've got to be born again. That's another must. You must be born again and be made alive spiritually. And so the spirit of man being made alive and able to communicate with God enables him to personally participate in worship, not just to pretend or to perform in a ceremony in some special place. I don't know if anybody's picking up what I'm putting down this morning, but I'm telling you there are buildings on top of buildings this morning that are full of people, and they got their guitars, and they got their pianos, and they got their songs, and they're singing, and they're going through it, and they're repetition trying to get you worked up on the inside, but there ain't no spirit that's alive on the inside. I'm telling you, listen, there ain't nothing wrong with a guitar, ain't nothing wrong with a piano, ain't nothing wrong with a set of drums if you use it right, but I'm telling you, if you ain't got the spirit alive on the inside, it makes no difference what kind of noise you make. It makes no difference what kind of prostrate position you're in. If your spirit's not alive on the inside and your spirit has not been quickened, if you've not been born again, you are not able to worship God. Buildings are full of religious, externally people. Each week, performing rites and customs. They're humming and Chanting and going through all kinds of rituals. But they're dead spiritually. They have no ability to genuinely worship God. They that worship Him must worship Him in spirit. You see, when our spirit is alive, it's then that we can acknowledge God's worth and worship Him, not materially, not necessarily physically, but spiritually. Worship is when... The redeemed, those that have been saved, begin to return thanks and adoration to their Redeemer by showing Him His worth to them. A.W. Tozer said it like this. He said, I would warn those who are cultured, quiet, self-possessed, and poised, and sophisticated that if they are embarrassed in church when some happy Christian says amen, they may actually be in need of some spiritual enlightenment. The worshiping saints of God in the body of Christ have often been a little noisy. Can I say this? Just because a person says amen does not make them spiritual, but it doesn't mean they're not either. 
And when someone's worship is so uh, real and so genuine and it overflows on the inside and it does begin to express in a lifted hand or a bowed head or a tear running down their cheek or a glory to God, amen, hallelujah, it ought not bother you. I was in a service years ago and a man said amen. A couple of people, I might have been one of them, said amen. And a fella come up to one of them after service and said, y'all are too noisy. You disturbed my worship experience. Can I just help you? If I disturb your worship experience, you wasn't too much into worship. Because you're not supposed to be focused on me when you worship. And I'll tell you something as a church. That's where we need to get today. We need to get to where when we come to church, we're not worried about, uh, listen, somebody on this side of the church and what they think and somebody over there, what they're going to say and what's the, am I going to impress the preacher? You're not going to impress the preacher. He probably ain't even paying attention to you. person across the aisle, they probably don't care what you do. But if you just uh, get, get overwhelmed in the goodness and the mercy and the love of God, realize how good he's been to you. He redeemed you. He reached down when you wasn't even looking up. He came further down than you could ever got up. He came a looking for you and he saved you. He redeemed you. He regenerated you. He birthed you into the family of God. He accepted you in the beloved. And you looking up at the king of kings and you ought to show him some worth. You thought I was worth saving? I was lost. I was undone. I was wicked. I don't even want to remember things I did. But he came by my way looking for me. He's down into the horrible pit out of the miry clay. He picked me up, set me on a rock, established my goal, established my goal, established my goal, established my goal, and put a new song in my mouth. Preacher, that worship is boring. I check up about it. But not only does he say that we worship him in spirit, with a spirit that has been made alive, he said, and in truth. Spirit requires salvation. Truth requires the scriptures. So not only does true worship demand salvation, it requires the scriptures. So we don't worship God on our terms. We don't worship God just any old way we please. We're in a day where people are saying, well, I think we ought to be able, and I th-. it really doesn't matter what you think and what I think. What matters is what does the Bible say. And it doesn't matter if it's three months old, three days old, or 300 years old. It's not about a man-made idea, a man-made method, or a man-made philosophy. Worship is to be in line with the Word of God. So we've got to be saved, but we've got to have the Scriptures. Worship is to be done God's way, regulated by God's Word. Worship must be in truth as opposed to falsehood, as opposed to false doctrine. Can I say it like this? If your worship is not in accordance with Scripture, it's not genuine worship at all. That means that our worship must be scripturally and doctrinally correct. That is, worship, listen to me, worship may be emotional at times, but worship is not just an emotional experience or outburst. Worship is not a cheap knockoff of a rock concert to stir people's emotions. When man can't worship many times, he'll substitute worship with entertainment. Worship is not always a song, but it does always involve submission. Worship is not a music style. Worship is a lifestyle. Get that if you don't get nothing else for a little while. Music is not a music style, it's a lifestyle. Go to Genesis 22 right quick. I I mentioned it earlier. I want to show you a couple things about worship in Genesis 22. If you can get over to Genesis chapter number 22, it's the first time that worship is mentioned in your Bible. And in Genesis 22, 1 through 14, you you can read it a little bit more in detail. I'm just going to go through it and give you some things right quick. 
about worship that we find. Number one, I see that worship is personal. The Bible said it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here I am. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son. And so down in verse number 5, Now Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship, and will come again to you. You say, what are you saying? I'm saying that Abraham had a personal relationship with God where God invited Abraham personally, and Abraham personally was going up on that mountain. And he told his servants, the young men, to stay behind. That just uh, lets you know that you don't have to be in a great big crowd to worship. A lot of times the best worship, quote unquote, experience you ever have it'll be you and God. Oh yeah, it'll be you and God somewhere where you're broken and you realize how great he is. I see that Abraham not only was personal in his worship, but I see that worship was passionate. You see, in verse number 22, or chapter 22, verse 2, he said, Take now thy son, thy only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee to the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering. Passion. Abraham, you think Abraham loved Isaac? He had been looking for, y'all remember he sinned, he messed up, and, 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 and he had Ishmael with, with Hagar. Y'all remember that? God gave him another chance, and, and he's going to take care of Ishmael, send him over here. He said, but, but Isaac's your son of promise. And Abraham loved Isaac. Isaac is going to be the one that the seed is going to be passed down through. And he loved him. And now God said, now God said, Abram, I know you love him. I know I promised him to you. I know you got what you're after. But Abraham, I want you to take him up there and sacrifice him. And you know what Abraham did? Abram, he took Isaac. He told the, the, the servants, the young men to stay behind. And he said, me and, the, me and this boy, we're going up yonder to worship. Daniel was a passionate act. It involved love. He, he Listen, you know what he proved there? He proved that he loved God more than he loved Isaac. He said, preacher, I don't know about that. I'm telling you, when you get, listen, when you look, get to the point where you love God more than anything else or anybody else, and you give it all to God, God will give you more than you ever dream of. I, saw, I see the participation in worship. He said in verse 5, I am the lad will go yonder and worship. Abram wasn't going to just sit there. And say, I'll let Isaac go do it. That's not for me. Abram got involved. He said, y'all stay here. Me and the, me and the lad, we're going to go yonder and worship. He's participating. I see this. It's priceless. Verse 10 said, and he took the knife. Y'all see this? He stretched forth his hand, took the knife to slay his son. That's the son that he loved. That's the son that he'd waited for. That's the son, Brother Tyler, that was the fulfillment of the promise from God. And now God tells him to lay him down on that altar. And he lays him down and he pulls back. And he's got the knife in his hand and he's about to come down and kill his son. Priceless, is it not? Might cost you some pride. Might cost you some possessions to worship God in your giving. It might cost you some pride to worship in your, in your, in your praise and testifying. Might cost your will to worship him. But worship is costly, it's priceless. But I see this as pleasing. Verse 11 through 13, the Bible said, The angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here I, am I. And he said, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seest thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked and beheld behind him and a ram, a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering instead of his son. You know what Abraham found out? He found out that when he gave what he had to God, God would, would, would give him everything that he needed and then some. Here's what you find out here. God wasn't near as interested in having Isaac sacrificed as he was having Abraham surrendered. That's a life of worship. Surrender totally to God. Submitted to God. 
not my will. This don't make sense to me, God, but your will be done. That's what your word says. I see this. Worship is productive. Verse 14, we are introduced to a new name that Abraham had for God in verse 14. And Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah. That's the Lord, Jireh. The Lord will see or the Lord will provide. He'll see to it. As it said in this day, under this day, he said, In the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. Jehovah Jireh, that is the Lord. What did he say earlier? That God will provide himself a lamb. God provided a lamb, a ram in a thicket. He's going to provide himself as a lamb in John 1, 29. But at, on, on Mount Moriah that day, Abraham found out that God was not just a God who was almighty. He was not just a God who was plural. He was not just a God, listen, who was the creator. But he's the God who would see to it. He would provide. You worship God and you'll find out God is everything you need. Worship is an act produced through a life of humble submission and obedience. We're talking about worshiping Him in spirit and in truth. That's humble submission and obedience. The psalmist reveals to us that worship was to be in holiness. Y'all know the verse. It's in Second or First Chronicles 16, 29, and in Psalm 29, 2, where it says, Give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of his holiness. Psalm 69, 9 said, Oh, worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Fear before him all the earth. I'm saying worship is a holy thing. Worship's not a man-made thing. It's a God. God designed thing. You don't worship God living in open, defiant disobedience against God and His Word. You don't worship God dressed immodest like women on the streets. You don't worship God with a fifth under your seat or wherever you hiding it. Listen, you're not going to worship God with hate and jealousy down in your heart against another brother. You're not going to worship God with gossip uh, springing off your tongue. You don't worship God with lust and fornication and adultery and evil thoughts in your heart. You can't worship worship God without holiness. You don't worship God with idols in your heart. You don't worship God if you're not walking and living in accordance with the truth of God's Word. They that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. God today is seeking those who will worship Him. By the way, by the way, and I'm closing. This is the first time. By the way, you are worshiping something or someone today. You said, not me, preacher. I'm not worshiping right now. You just, you just mark it down. You, you, you note where you devote the bulk of your time, where you focus your attention, your thoughts, your desires, your finances, I'm talking about without earthly constraint. Not when the boss tells you you got to do this and when you got to do that. But when you have the choice, when you have the freedom to do what you want to do, where do your thoughts go? Where does your attention go? That will help you find out what or who you're worshiping. In other words, when you can choose what or who do you choose. And I say this. It's time to worship God. I've already said it. I won't re-preach it, but he's worthy. He's worthy. He's worthy. It's time to worship. I don't know where you are in your life today. You may never have been saved. You may need to have your spirit quickened, made alive. You may need to bow before the Lord Jesus. Ask him to save you. He'll save you today. You may be living in sin, you may be away from God, and, and you want to have your uh, relationship with Him um, uh, cleaned up and have that fellowship restored, and you want, you want that relationship to be close and, and to be a, a relationship and a, a time of communion where you can worship Him. He'll, he'll forgive you if you come and confess. You may just have a heart and you say, Preacher, I want to worship God. I love Him. He's been so good to me. And I want my life to count for Jesus. I want to worship. Listen, worship does not negate work. 
But the best workers will be the best worshipers. When we learn to worship God, we won't mind getting involved in what God's involved in. May God help us truly to worship. Not just on Sunday morning, not just at the church house. Oh, it's wonderful. It, listen, I long to see a church just basking in the glory and worshiping God in the beauty of His holiness. But if you can't worship Him on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, you're going to have a hard time worshiping Him on Sunday. When we get to where we worship God in our life and through everything that we do, when we realize that our work is our worship and our home is, and we can worship and, and, and in our interactions with others, we can still worship God. When we begin to truly worship God in our lives, Sunday will just be like an overflow. Sunday, or whenever we come to church, it'll just be like, whoa! Let me tell you how good God's been this week. Let me tell you about my time that I spent with God. But anyway, listen, church, he is seeking, seeking such to worship him. May God help us to worship him. Father, I pray that you would take the message. Bless it, I pray, according to your will. I pray if there's one here today that's lost, they need to be saved. I pray, God, you'd save them. I pray, God, you'd help us as the church fall in love with you, humble ourselves before you, surrender our lives to you, and worship you. Worship you because you're worthy. Worship you. We don't deserve you. We don't deserve your mercy. We don't deserve your goodness. You've been good to us doubly good, more than good. And I want to say this morning, I love you, God. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for loving us here. Help us. Oh, God, where we fail you, help us to worship you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. We're standing all across the auditorium. Some have already come. You need to come. You're making your way to the altar.